Listener Production. G'day, it's Rusty here, all set for part two of my podcast with respected F1 TV reporter Louise Goodman. Coming up, the Dare to be Different program and how proud she is now of the great work they are doing. Plus, hanging out, working with the great Murray Walker. Now, if you've somehow found yourself on the grid here for part two and kind of haven't taken in quali, part one of this episode, jump back to the garage and give it a listen. From working with the live wire, Eddie Jordan, to freaking out a bit when Eddie Irvine was water skiing days before a Grand Prix with Neil Crompton at the helm of the boat. PR work with Martin Brundle and a cool stunt where he traded places with rally legend Colin McRae. Plus, a young UK traveller taking in Australia before an opportunity at the Adelaide Grand Prix helped set her on a path of a big F1 adventure. We begin part two with a special moment in the history of the Jordan team and how Lou was on the spot at Spa in Belgium to convey the moment for millions of viewers watching in the UK and beyond. There is a beautiful moment of crossover for you in the whole um, Jordan experience, the whole television experience. Am I right in saying... I think you were there for the Jordan 1-2 and you were the first to interview EJ after the win. I was. You are right, yes, at, at the Spa Grand Prix. Um, and, and I'd always said to Eddie, because the, throughout my time with Jordan as a press officer, we, we'd never run. Throughout my time as a press officer, full stop, I was never with a team that ever won a race. At Leighton House, we came very close at the French Grand Prix one year when the cars were, you know, running one and two. And then um, Ivan Capelli eventually finished in P2. But, you know, a jo- I was really good at writing a we almost did this press release, but I'd never done the whole we've, we've run a race scenario. And I said to Eddie, who, you know, when I'd said to him, I'm off to work for for ITV, it was like, fantastic, wonderful. Um, and we had the deal that, you know, when Jordan wins the first Grand Prix, I'm having the first interview made. It was like, yeah, no problem. So when that happened at Spa, um, you know, obviously I was delighted. It was it was my team. I, I, I still felt like part of it in a way that, you know, I was able to really savour that win for them because it was the people I've been working with for, for years. Um, yeah, and listen, I just, it was a bit of a free for all. Uh, in terms of everybody trying to get the interview. But I, I piled in from the back, you know, in the rain. It's like, Eddie, you're mine. And he was like, yep, yep, this one's for Lou. Come on through. So it was it was great. It was a it was a special moment to be able to, you know, to get that. That, that first interview is always an important interview, to be able to get the first interview, to get the actually, you know, the real in the moment. By the time somebody's excited for the ninth time that they've lost some of the excitement of it so being the first person to, to get that interview with EJ was great uh, the, my other first was was getting the first interview with Lewis Hamilton when he eventually won the world championship and you know that was that was similar circumstances in that everybody was absolutely you know it was teeing it down with rain and it was mayhem so that was another get your elbows out and fight your way through scenario you, you do uh when you're on the grid like that i know it's tough for martin these days sometimes which i think is so wrong celebs should talk to him when he's doing that that grid walk and, and i know they're meant to now under the under the new rules i just cannot believe the way some of them um carry on but i want to draw people's attention to one for you what about the oceans 11 stars <laughs> in monaco yeah, that was a that was a bit of a coup. They came down there promoting. Um, they'd done a tie up with with Jaguar um, and Navsidi, who was the, the 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 very good and another kind of you know he was the kind of guy who would come up with. He's the guy who stuck a diamond on the nose of the Jaguar car. That's another story. But they'd done this deal with with the Ocean's Eleven. Um, the guys were, were promoting the film in at the Cannes Film Festival, which was on just down the road. And they were coming up to, to Monaco to have a photo call in the garage. And um, Nav had tipped the wink to a, a couple of the key broadcasters. And thankfully, I was one of them as to where they were going to be coming in. So most people were standing up by the garage waiting for them. Nav had said to us, OK, we're coming in a boat. And they're going to come in through that gate. Then we're going to walk up. So we were all stood around there basically ready to get to get the interviews um and we worked out who was going to talk to who so i said right i'm going to go for brad pitt first somebody else was going you know for for george clean 
nobody went for Damon, um, Matt Damon first, which was terrible. But but anyway, so I pile in with uh, with Brad Pitt, who just totally blanked me. And you sometimes think, well, maybe he didn't hear, so I tried again. And he just totally blanked me again, which I, I just... I, I hate it when people do that. I just think you could at least look and say, you know, whatever. But anyway, I turned around. I, I interviewed Matt Damon. Mm. He was lovely. George Clooney is given at large to everybody, chatting away. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go in there as well. So I said, oh, hi, George, you know, you've got time for one. Sure, oh, sorry, who are you? Where are you from? And he's given an interview. Yeah, come on, fire away, fire away. Gave me a lovely interview. He was he was really, really great. Um, and in fact, we then got up to the Jaguar garage where the photo call was. And I, I always used to watch the start of the race from their garage. So I went round to the back and, and the boys and you know, the mechanics were out the back went, we're not really supposed to let anyone in. I went, look, oh, what's that over there? So they kind of went, oh, what is that? You know, I snuck in the back while they weren't looking. Um, and, and I think by that point, uh, Brad Pitt could then see, well, hang on, it's that bloody woman again, and she's behind the scenes with us now. So he did finally give me give me the interview. He said, I tell you what, Mike, I had so many people contact. Oh, my God, I can't believe you got to speak to George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon. And so that's probably the interview <laughs> that's got, got the most attention from, you know, people, friends who had no interest whatsoever in Formula One. But, like, suddenly it's like, oh, my God, you interviewed George Clooney? Now I'm interested. Now, tell me about, I mean, you're proudly from the UK, obviously, so I could immediately think Silverstone is the fave race, but is it Monaco? Has there been a, a GP along the way, either from memories, from the racing, whatever? What's been one that you, you kind of cherish or look forward to the most? Um, I don't have a favourite. I do enjoy, you know, Silverstone um, because I I love the fact that I think it's a very, uh, you know, the, the a Silverstone crowd is a very knowledgeable crowd and just loves a good race. I've I've been lucky enough to go on the flatbed truck when the drivers are doing the, the you know the parade around the circuit before before the race. I've been lucky enough to go on that on a couple of occasions doing interviews and I love all the M's. So you know Monza, which I've mentioned, Montreal always used to be great fun. That was just because it's it's you know the circuit is so close to the city. The entire city had a real festival atmosphere about it, so that was always great. Um, and and you know, I love Suzuka just because, again, I think Japan is a really interesting country. But the passion that the fans have—it's a very different kind of passion. It's a very polite passion. You know, we'd go there back in the early days when we had pre-qualifying. It'd be dark when we got then. You you know, when the sun eventually mm. came up, the grandstands were full. You hadn't heard, <laughs> hadn't had a sound. You know, you contrast that with somewhere like Interlagos, where they do not stop blowing horns and banging drums from from dawn till dusk. But so very different atmospheres in places. And as you know, I love Melbourne. I just love, you know, I get excited. I I land in Oz. I get a golden gay time inside me as quick as I can. And I, I love coming to that race. It's partly down to getting to see, um, you know, having a bit of a holiday and getting to see my mates afterwards. But it does feel very, I spent a lot of time there over the years. So it does partly feel like a like a second home. Um, and I have so many, so many friends over there. You know, my uh, my girlfriend obviously but lots of people I've met through her her daughter is my goddaughter she's now got kids of her own you know so I'm up on the farm with them and catching up with other mates and getting some holiday in somewhere in the sunshine and, and yeah it's the other thing to bear in mind it's you know I've I've left an English winter and I'm I'm heading out to to an Australian hopefully summer although let's face it Melbourne doesn't always play ball in that respect does it we've, we've had a few wet ones over the years I spoke to James Allen for the podcast. He gave me a little bit of intel. He says he seems to recall perhaps it was Ferrari giving you guys some branded phones one year, maybe with their connection to, to Vodafone when they were backing or sponsoring Ferrari. And he says for me to ask you what happened to yours. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little bit of a habit. I used to keep my phone in my... I had a little um, pouch thing on my belt that it would sit in. And I had a... Twice it happened to me. Um, 
and one of them was in Melbourne, the other one was in, in at the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa. It fell down into the toilet, you know, <laughs> and in Spa particularly, it was like, it was just one of those, <laughs> one of those, you know, port that you heard the clunk of that. And it's like, oh, that's, that's gone, gone, gone. That's down into some recess that nobody ever wants to go into. Thankfully, in Melbourne, there was, there was slightly more, um, you know, it was more like a sort of normal toilet rather than a, so I'm, 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 I'm not ashamed to say it was literally as I was sitting down nothing else had happened so my hand went straight down and pulled the phone out but there was no way that was happening with my my lovely little as you say Ferrari branded Vodafone freebie in in spa that was gone 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 thanks James for sharing that <laughs> now tell me um you've got a great relationship I think with with Johnny Herbert and he's also reminded me James to sort of chat about that some of the fun over the years there's some good stories with with Johnny isn't there yeah, Johnny was one of those drivers who I'd worked with when when he was at Camel when he first came in um, with uh, when he was at the Lotus team. Just always got on well with him, and we always used to have a laugh with each other. So you know, he was one of the as I said, the British drivers were all great with me when I when I moved into doing television. But I do remember at Silverstone um, in our first year, um, Johnny said to me, "Oh, you you see me a bit more." a little bit more relaxed now. I was like, yeah, I'm kind of getting a feel for it now. I'm getting a bit better. And he said, okay, that's when the fun starts. I went, what? I went, oh, no, no, nothing. And anyway, cut forward Sunday on the grid. I'm standing beside him waiting, you know, to do a live interview with him. Um, and Johnny starts poking me. This hand comes out. It's like digging me beneath the ribs. And so <laughs> I'm like, whacked him stop it and so <laughs> I'm waiting for my throat even when my throat came you know I'm I'm asking hopefully incisive questions about how he's feeling about competing at the British Grand Prix but off camera you know he's still poking me and I'm kicking him and you know basically acting like stupid children he's trying to trying to put me off my put me off my stride and it happened on a, on a couple of occasions there was you know there was one interview at the where were we? I can't remember which Grand Prix it was, but again, he was poking and prodding me and grabbing bits of me he really shouldn't have been grabbing. And, you know, this was this was all going on kind of off camera. Um, he also used to uh, um, kind of... Uh, the, then nowadays, it's all very organised. And if a driver goes out during the race, you know, the team brings them to the, to the pen and you see them doing the interview there. But back in the day... It was just a bit of a free for all, trying to work out where the driver was, and so Johnny would see me coming, and Johnny, who, quite frankly, got a funny little walk because he did so much damage to his his feet in his big Formula Three Thousand accident, but he'd see me coming, he'd look over his shoulder, and he'd start walking faster, and I'd like I'm coming for you, mate. He'd start walking faster, and then he'd break into. Him. I was like, wait, stop there. <laughs> and so some people, we had a couple of occasions when. Um, People said, oh, what was what happened with Johnny last night? It looked like he'd really upset you. What do you mean? He went, well, it looked like you were giving me a telling off. I said, oh, no, no, that's just me and Johnny pissing about. You really don't need to worry about that. No, he hadn't upset me at all. We're just being stupid. So, uh, and it's, you know, it's still, I, I, a few years ago, I was working in uh, Singapore at the, the Grand Prix. Um, and um, I was right at the back of the plane and feeling really grumpy about the fact that I was shoved in a corner and just about to take off. And, a, and one of the hostesses came up and said, um, oh, there's been a seat change for you. Those words everybody loves to hear, seat change. So it's like, fine, I'm coming out. So we walked forward. I thought, how far are we going? Anyway, we got to we got to the approaching business class and she said, there's a seat over there by the window or there's a seat here. And it was the back row seat in business class looking back which which is normally not where anywhere i want to see anyway they're sitting there as well with johnny herbert with two glasses of champagne it's like right mate i'm coming and we just sat and jabbered the whole he'd been in a similar situation he'd been given an upgrade as well so so we just sat and jabbered the whole way home and we will still do that you know i met up with him at the grand prix at monaco this year and we're, we're, we're jabbering away so people like johnny people like eddie eddie irvine who you know his sister has become is one of my best mates so i'll, I'll still catch up with uh with Eddie Irvine on, on quite a regular basis as well. He hasn't changed. He's just got a bit bit madder, a bit more barking. You also got to work as a part of some of the names you've rattled off here with the great Murray Walker. He's no longer with us, obviously, yes. but people would love a story or two about being around Murray for, for part of your time there. Oh, uh, Murray was just, you know, I, I, I'd obviously worked with Murray in, as, a, as a press officer um, and, and he was always so, just so lovely. Um, back in the day, we used to send out our press releases via fax 
Uh, but Murray's wife didn't like the fax machine disturbing her. So Murray's I had to print off and post to him. You know, by then it was totally out of date, but he liked it for his for his record so that he could, you know, categorise it and have it there for information for the next race. And he was, you know, I remember him and I still have it somewhere in my files here. When I when I moved from Leighton House to work for Jordan, you know, he wrote me a letter saying, oh, congratulations, dear. I'm so pleased to hear about your new job and I'm sure you'll love it there. And just, just the kind of person Murray was. So to get to work for him and we used to, you know, myself and James Allen uh, used to drive with Murray to and from the circuit quite a lot. So we had all Murray's stories about his days in the advertising industry and which were, you know, which was, which was so funny. Um, and again, I remember one year driving... I think we were en route to Hockenheim and Murray was telling us some of his war stories, um, having, you know, um, been in the parachute corps, I think it was in the, in the Second World War. And he obviously decided that James and I weren't paying enough attention to what he was saying. And from the back seat, we heard, pay attention, you two. I almost died so we could drive across this bridge. James and I were like, oh, sorry, sorry, Murray. But he was just such a sweetheart. A man of his time in some ways. I remember at the British Grand Prix one year, there was a, he'd done an interview with the, with the Mail on Sunday, which is one of the big Sunday papers over here. Um, and uh, in, and in that interview, he, said but you know formula one isn't really a place for for women or words to that effect so one of the guys pointed it out i said like, okay well, i'll go and have a chat with murray about it so i said murray this um this interview you've done yes 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 dear. i said there's this bit here you said formula one paddock's not really a place for women well it's not really dear is it i mean you know it's it, it's it's more of a masculine i said murray i'm a woman he said I didn't mean you, dear. I didn't mean you at all. But you just think, oh, bless him. You know, he was mortified at the thought that he'd, you know, he'd upset me. But that was just, you know, that was just a a typical mind. But such a, such a sweet man. Um, And to have the opportunity to, to work so closely with such an absolute legend of, of the sport and, and of broadcasting, not just here in the UK, but obviously much love down there in Australia as well. Lou worked with James Allen for many years. He was the voice of F1 for a time. These days James has a management position with one of the most respected digital platforms. The growing and changing audience the sport now enjoys because of the drive to survive effect is massive. And then with the younger generations, it's clear that they, they then think, what is this? This is great. Who is Dan Ricardo? This kid's cool. Look at him. He's got tats. He's funny. You know, this Lando Norris guy, this Max Verstappen guy, God, him and Hamilton, they really hate each other. This is fascinating. And then the cast of characters around, you know, Toto Wolff and Gunter Steiner and Christian Horner and all, they're just totally wrapped up in it. James Allen is in the Rusty's library. For the record, Rusty is not on the board of any big conglomerates. No CEO or management types should be subjected to that. A bloke making car noises at AGMs. He can talk, though. Back to his pod with Louise Goodman. For you, a very special part of your life. I mean, when you're immersed in it like that, you get to know the people um, and so on. And I was going to, if you're comfortable, talk about John Boy because he was... Yeah, you know, I'm always a, happy to talk about John Boy. Hmm. I mean, he was a, a great... Um, character in the pit lane, people will know him from Minardi and so on. Very sadly, he's no longer um, with us. And I know some time has passed there now, Lou, but that must have been enormously difficult for you. It was a very, very difficult time. Um, I, yeah, obviously. I mean, John Boy, um, we we first met when um, we both worked at, at Jordan at the same time. He'd been he'd worked with Eddie for for many many years. He'd been Eddie's mechanic when you know back it back in Ireland um so we met when he was working at Jordan but we it was a few years after that um that we that we sort of got together so um and he had a, a massive heart attack just before the British Grand Prix one year it was actually we were we were down in London they were um running the cars up and down um Regent Street one of the big big roads in London um as a sort of promotional thing all the Formula One teams were there and and uh, yeah John Boy had a, had a massive heart attack and, and died a few years later on the, the Friday of the, of the British Grand Prix. So, um, yeah, obviously horrendously tough times, but it was it was a time when you kind of become thankful for the Formula One family. I mean, ITV were brilliant. They said, take off 
as much time as you like if you want to miss one race if you want to miss five races we're behind you whatever you want to do mm. in fact once you've got through the kind of immediate aftermath of, of something like that with you know organizing funerals and I, I kind of wanted to get back to not that life was going to be normal again but normal routine shall we say um so i actually went to the i think it was the following grand prix it was at hockenheim anyway but um and you then become aware of the fact that you know how much of a family formula one is i mean even you know when john had been in the hospital I'd, I'd had a phone call i'd been called to the nursing station one day and they said we we have a man on the phone um, who says he'd like to talk to you? Um, this is very unusual because he's not family, and and we you know we want to check. When I said, well, who is it? They said his name is Professor Sid Watkins. So Sid had found out that John Boyd had a heart attack, had found out which hospital he was in, and and had made them you know Amazing. put him through so that you know he he kind of pulled rank um, and said I need to speak. So uh, you know just to say, is there anything I can do? Talk me through it. What's happening? What kind of care are you getting? Etc. 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 And that for me was just an example of of what you know what Formula One would would do. Certainly back then, you know, it, it's much bigger now the teams are much bigger there's uh, you know mm. it's a slightly different atmosphere but um you know it everybody dialed in how could they help me uh, and in fact when i went the first time i went back to a race you know obviously i'm 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 having to deal with a lot of people coming up to me and wanting to sympathize with me and um you know it's it, it's almost role reversal in some ways because you know everybody else is now crying at me and <laughs> i'm comforting other people and thinking Ooh, um, but it was lovely that you know to, to know that many people can, and obviously you know very special um, Paul Stoddart uh, th- that British Grand Prix weekend um, when John Boy died he you know took all the the logo sponsor logos off the off the rear wing and you know just put John Boy um, mm. on on the rear wing so so for me you know sitting at home with with my family and, and watching that race I'd literally just got got home back to my house from from London where we as I said, where we were when, when John Boy died, that was, you know, it, it it really meant something, as did the messages from, you know, from the, the team at ITV who'd put together a little piece about it. And yeah. so it was, yeah, uh, difficult times. But, to, uh, you know, when anybody goes through something like that, and obviously lots of people have been through that situation, you know, the, the response from friends and family makes a, makes a huge difference. Um, and that was certainly for me, made a very difficult situation just that little bit easier just from knowing that there are knowing there are people who who care and, and feeling the love for it all mm. your effervescence um even now i love you're a, you're an amazing human being lou as we move to a little bit of racing here often in television you get to do some things um and experience what life is like in the racing environment and try and convey that to the audience and I think if memory serves you were part of a pit stop for the Midland team weren't you with Diego Montero at the British Grand Prix in 2006 is that right I was I was we'd we'd planned a feature uh, that had that had started out much earlier in the year and it was with the BAR team they were doing a pit stop practice I was stood watching it and Alistair Alistair Gibson um who was their number one mechanic at the time, said to me, you ought to have a go at this. I don't think any women have ever done this in a race. I'm like, I'm up for that. So we kind of hatched a plan. And I spent a lot of time at every Grand Prix. I would join the team for their pit stop practice. Um, and and so we basically then built a feature around, or two features around it, one for the race day at the British Grand Prix um, and the other one for the qualifying day. And this was before Formula One. Formula One now films every single race um, and gives that to all of the broadcasters. But back in these days, some of the races, and the British Grand Prix was one of them, were filmed by the host broadcast. So ITV provided all of the footage. That meant that they could, we could guarantee that they would show me doing the pit stop. So that's why we did it for the British Grand Prix. So I've done all my training for months in advance. The week of the British Grand Prix, I think it was like the Monday or something, I get a phone call um, from Gilles de Ferran, who was the sporting director with BR at the time, said, listen, I'm really sorry, Louise, but we've just had a meeting and you can't do that. It's like, you are kidding me. You know, we've got two features set up around this. And I was a little bit angry, um, but also mm. thinking, 
for God's sake, you know, A, why? I've done all the practice. Everybody has to do it for the first time at some point. And we're, we're in refueling days here. So we're not talking sub two second pit stops. You know, you know, you've got a good eight, nine seconds to, to get it done. So um, it, it wasn't so much that. But anyway, for whatever reason, they decided I, I couldn't be part of their pit stop team. So then I'm left with a with a with a huge hole to fill in our scheduling. So I phoned up Andy Stevenson, who was the sporting director at Midland, as had been Jordan. So obviously, I'd known Andy since he was a grubby little number two mechanic and said to Andy, I've got this. He went, yeah, you take it with us. Well, would you need to speak to him? No, no, you'll be fine. It's not that difficult, you know. The boys all had to do it for the first. Yeah, you'll be fine. You do it. For Just come along and do a practice with us on the Thursday and the Friday. So it's like, okay, cool. So, so, and so, I, and the first time I went to do the practice, my job was was rear left tire off, which is pretty much the easiest thing. Car comes in to stop, goes up on the jacks. Wheel gun man goes in, brrr, and then I'm pulling the tire off. I went to do what I'd been practicing and doing and was so easy to do on the BAR. And it was a slightly different action on the middle. And it was like, oh, my God, no. So so I had to, you know, like learn, like, no, wedge your elbow here for this one and pull it this way. And it's a little bit of an up movement. And once I got that, I was absolutely fine. But so we, we cut forward. And then Andy came up to me just before the race and said, oh, bit of a, that was an interesting meeting. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've just told the engineers you're doing the pit stop. And I went, what do you mean you've just told them? He said, well, I wasn't going to tell them earlier. They'll only get a big fuss about it. No, they don't need to know. You know. So <laughs> he'd, he'd broken this to them in the morning meeting. So and the irony was, actually, um, Jensen, whose car I was originally going to do the pit stop on, the British driver, his car broke down. He never even got to do a pit stop. So had it stuck with the BAR team. I would never have got to do the pit stop. Instead, you know, I, I did it with uh, with Thiago. So, um, yeah, and I think, I believe, um, I'm still, appallingly, the only woman who's actually done that during the course of a Grand Prix. Um, hopefully that will that will change very soon. But I think, you, you know, you'll see women getting involved in the pit stops in other capacities. But, yeah, and I, and I think... Um, I'm I'm still the the only woman who's actually done a wheel on wheel off capacity during a during a Formula One pit stop, which hopefully is something that will that will be changing very soon. You would go in in 2009, I think it was, and do some work also for the British Touring Car Championship, and you've retained the links with the BTCC to this day. So tell us a bit more about that. I think there's a, a kind of co-hosting role. You're working with, uh, no doubt, uh, a good connection to Alan Gow and uh, and so on. Yeah, I love that championship. So yes, when when ITV pulled out of the Formula One coverage, um, aside from thinking, shit, got no job now, I then thought, okay, I would like to get back in and do touring cars. I'd done a season in 2007, didn't do it in 2008. So I thought, right, 2009, I want, really want to get back into to doing it. So thankfully that came off. And it's... it's uh, People, I'm sure, will, will know of it, but it's kind of our version of the of the of the Aussie V8s. Um, but yes, masterminded by by um, Alan Gow, uh, who who's straight straight talking Aussie, basically, isn't he? You know, it's um, so it's uh, and I just love it. You know, Formula One is is a special um, special paddock. It's an amazing space. It's been brilliant to, to work in Formula One, and I still do work. You know, in in Formula One, albeit not full time. But it's kind of, uh, I do find myself, you know, it's it's micromanaged in this day and age. And there's always somebody saying, you know, you can't stand here. You've got to this side of a line. You've got to stand two centimetres away on that side of a line. And after 20 years of that, you get a bit like, oh, mate, really get a life. And there's none of that in touring cars. ITV are a much bigger fish in a much smaller pond. Um, and and obviously the, the drivers and the teams are all very aware of the the synergy between the, the television coverage that we provide and what they can get from it. So they are very open. They are very accommodating. Um, you know, drivers come out of briefings. I can remember the first time I knocked on the door of one of the trailers um, to looking for a driver the door opened they were very clearly having an engineering briefing which you know as a press officer even let alone a journalist had I gone anywhere near one of our engineering briefings I would have had my head torn off but so there I was let but it's like no what are you right it's like I was just looking for can't remember who the driver was and they went oh yeah and they sent him out of an engineering briefing to do an interview with me. I thought, oh, this is a whole different ball game here, isn't it? So, so it's um, yeah, it's just such a lovely environment to work in. And also, the racing is bloody brilliant. I'm regularly jumping up and down and shouting at the television. Um, you know, watching the watching the touring car races. It's it's elbows out. Um, you know, all systems go. 
20 minute, 25 minute, you know, a, a minutes of mayhem, chaos, adrenaline. You know, I, I absolutely love it. We also on the bill have, you know, amongst the support categories, we've got things like the British Formula 4 Championship, which... Again, that that's where all the youngsters are cutting their teeth. So, you know, I first met Lando Norris as a tiny, weeny little 14-year-old actually racing in a, a category called the Janetta Junior Championship. Um, and then he moved up into to British yeah. F4. But so we get to see and we'll get a lot of foreign drivers will come and race in British F4. So Oscar Piastri, for example, you know, did his single seater racing here in the UK in British F4. Logan Sargent, another driver who's come up through through British F4. So it's great for, for me to have interviewed those drivers as, as little kids back in the day. And I'm now still interviewing them, you know, either when I'm down in, in Melbourne for the Grand Prix or I, I'll do some work in paddock clubs at some of the events nowadays. And, and there's that same driver who is, you know, now reached the, the heady heights of, of Formula One. It's been lovely seeing seeing Oscar and all his family this year as well. You know, so excited to, to be at the races with him. And um, I was... Um, chatting to them in in uh, Bahrain I was working in the paddock club in Bahrain and I was chatting to his family well, I said something about friends and family and this massive cheer went up from everybody in the front row so it's like okay that'll be your friends and family there so I was chatting with them afterwards and and then I saw them again uh well like Melbourne they came running up hi Louise <laughs> like hi you know still I, I think it's lovely when you can still see people still have that enthusiasm you know uh, I still have that enthusiasm when I go to Grand Prix now. I think if you're doing it, if I was still doing it full time, I would have lost some of that enthusiasm. Um, so it's lovely when you see that enthusiasm in people because it, you know, it's it's really hard work, Formula One. And nowadays, you know, we used to get to Monza, we would have Japan, Australia, flyaway races, jobs are good and end of season. Whereas nowadays, you get to Monza at the end of the European season, they've got like another eight long distance flyaways with yeah. you know triple headers, and it's seriously, seriously hard work nowadays. Amazing. Could you tell that some of those names you rattled off, like Lando and Oscar, were, were going to be stars of the future? Do you know, I think you can. You can never guarantee somebody's going to be a star. But I think, you know, over the years I've learned, and you said right back at the beginning about media training, which is something that I do now. And you can see when drivers hmm. come in, um, you, you get to know the characteristics that somebody needs to have to go all the way. And it's 100% not just down to their driving ability. Obviously, that's a key part of it. But attitude and application are what separates, you know, there are a, a lot. And in fact, a very good example of that, um, and I hope he doesn't listen to this <laughs> when I'm <laughs> quoting him adversely. When I was, I knew when Oscar got into Formula One, I'm thinking, which which year was he doing? Which year? He? And I suddenly realised the reason why Oscar in British F4, I didn't have so many memories of him, was because there was a driver called Jamie Caroline who'd absolutely blitzed the championship that year. Um, Jamie's a British driver and he got so far because he had the wrong attitude and he didn't imply himself in the in the same way that a driver like like Oscar did. So so gotcha. you can you can you can see that in mm. youngsters. I back in in the early days when I was doing my my media training, I did a session for World Series by Renault. Um and they got all of the drivers. So that was a World Series by Renault. It was kind of like British F4 or F4 level. The, the, the championship doesn't exist anymore, but yes. um, raced around Europe. And when they had the British race, they took all the drivers along to Enstone, where the, as was Renault, now Alpine factory is not far away, uh, to, so that they could spend some time with the engineers, look around the factory, do a few bits and bobs. And one of the things that they, they wanted was, was to do some media training. So I had a big group of drivers really difficult racing drivers as you know have short attention spans you need to keep them involved you need to keep them engaged the whole time so i was thinking my god how am i going to write this session that keeps them all engaged so we we're in a, a sort of a lecture theater at at um at the factory and as the drivers came in i was expecting them all to go and sit in the back seat and be slumped down like oh bloody hell we've got to do media training now but actually there were a couple of them who came and sat right at the front the whole time i'm talking throughout all of the the exercises that we're doing they're asking me questions they're hanging on my every word there one of them was slightly challenging well oh, i don't think i'm trying to explain why i was you know that was fine anyway those two drivers one of them was a very young australian daniel ricardo and the other one was a french guy called jean eric fern Fantastic. and you know those were the two drivers who stood out in that session and those were the two drivers who went on 
to subsequent su- success. So you you can it is as I say it's that it's not just the driving ability. It's it's the desire and the passion and the asking the questions and the wanting to go the extra mile. That's what makes them stand out. I love it. That's a great takeaway for young racers listening to the podcast. Thank you. Can we also talk before we wrap this up, Lou, about something that's really, um, I think, important? And you have been kind of a pioneering figure in this for me in in many respects. I'm sure you'll say that there's lots of others as well. But for for women in motorsport, it was a smaller group probably to begin with when you were, you know, sitting out in, you know, in in public relations and working with teams and so on. But now what was Dare to be Different, which has become FIA Girls on Track um, on so on. And I think you've even attended not just the UK version of, of that. You've been a part of it in Melbourne and so on. It's become a seriously um, important and and thankfully a very successful thing, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. And I've really done an about face on a personal level with this because when I was first working as a girl in the paddock, uh, I didn't say so what, I'm a girl, big deal, whatever, makes no difference. I'm just here to do a job. Don't point out, don't make it special, nothing. Mm. You know, and even when I was working with ITV, I can remember there was a there was a girl who was working as a data analyst at, at Red Bull and and um, you know, the boss of this said, Oh, we need to have a word. like, no, don't do that, don't want to do that. So what? It's a girl working in a subsequently over the years I've had so many girls come up to me and say oh my god when I saw you working in Formula One when I saw you doing touring cars I thought oh girls can do that so I've realized actually there is some some benefit to to that visibility um and you know it 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 can be a controversial topic because effectively we're saying like have a bias towards the girls but I think you know, there is a benefit to doing that because I think the public perception, and for me, it's it's people outside the sport rather than in the sport. You know, if you ask a Formula One team, they don't care whether you're male, female, they're highly competitive and they want the best people for any given job. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the talent pool, there are less girls, there are less people from from sort of, you know, a diversity of, of, of ethnic backgrounds. So, why is that? You've got to look at the education system. What's telling people that girls do this and boys do that? And, you know, so for me, it's I think it's really important to that we do open people's eyes um, to the fact that, you know, motorsport is there are loads of jobs there that are open to, to anybody. Um, but I, I remember doing a podcast a few years ago. And and I was hosting it, and we had a bunch of engineers um, working in Formula One, six girls, five of them had been to all girls schools. And that to me said, hang on a minute, what's going on here in our education system that it's kind of defaulting towards, if you're in a, a mixed education, it's defaulting towards the boys doing engineering, it's defaulting towards the boys doing those STEM subjects that are likely to lead on to, to you know, to to work in in Formula One. Um, Because if you look at the majority of the girls in motorsport, they're in media, they're in marketing, they're in areas of the sport that traditionally there there have been more women. So, and I think that that needs to be changed. And I think that visibility is is part of it. You need to see it to believe that that you can be it. So so that's why I I wholly, you know, jumped on board with Dare to be Different. That's why I think, you know, Lewis Hamilton's um, initiative is really important as well. You know, he's put, not just his his name, but his own, you know, put his hand in his back pocket to to fund um, some um, scholarships for for people from you know um, diverse ethnic backgrounds to to get into it because it's a similar kind of thing. It's that you know expectation of who's going to be doing what job um, that I think we need to change. So um, you know, just to contradict that, you know, when you come to things like the W series. I personally am not in, I've done a little bit of driving. I've done more rallying than I have racing. I'm I'm not in favour of all girl series. For me, it's like when I was rallying, you know, they'd say you're the fastest lady driver. I used to say to her, I'm the fastest driver with tits. Who cares? You know, <laughs> that's irrelevant. I'm not the fastest driver. I didn't win. I I take the I take the check that went with it because that was useful for my budget. But and so similarly, you know, with W series, I'm like, who wants to be the fastest woman driver? I just, you know. I think it's about being the fastest driver. I've always celebrated the fact that I think, you know, equestrian, sailing, motor racing are are three sports where men and women can and do compete on a, on a totally um, level, level footing. But what I, what I do like about things like W series, and obviously now we've got the, the F1 Academy, which again, on the level of being an all female 
championship, you know, it, it's irrelevant. Um, and there are a lot of other racing drivers who would say the same thing, female racing drivers. It's like, I don't want to compete just against girls. I just want to compete. But I wholeheartedly applaud and celebrate the the exposure that it gives, so that it opens people's eyes so that, you know, when they see a girl, and this is what Susie Stoddard, who first set up Dare to be Different, um, which, as you say, was the was the cornerstone of, of what is now FIA Girls on Track. Um, you know, she said it's it, it is that it is that visibility and having that visibility is so important because if you can't see people doing that, you don't know that you can do that. And, you know, 20 years ago, young girls were looking at, at Formula One and the only or the most obvious example of a woman working in that sport was, was a was a dolly girl holding a pit board. So um, I think it's really good that we're now seeing, you know, girls holding clipboards because they're they're engineering and uh, you know doing doing that kind of thing um hopefully it won't be long before we see more girls with with spanners because they're you know they're they're working as mechanics and you know will do i want it to be 50 50 no it's it's not about that it's not like you know i I think it's some people are always going to veer towards something and i think it's probably you know more likely that that um you know, more men will veer towards engineering. But I think we need to make it a level playing field so that it's the same opportunity. And also so that I think if you look back to a lot of the women who worked in motorsport back in the day, we're all quite strong, feisty women. And I think we needed to be in order to fight our corner. Um, And uh, therefore, you know, that's that's a, a, a personal characteristic. It doesn't make you good at your job. But if you have to be good at your job, and be a strong feisty women, that's cutting out a whole load of women who are just really good at the job but might not be strong, feisty and, uh, you know, prepared as we all were to say, sod off, you know, and, and, and fight our own corners and join in with the banter kind of thing. So so I think it's, um, yeah, really important that, that that gets promoted, which is why I'm so happy to attend the events here in the UK to, you know, meet up with the girls down down in in melbourne at the grand prix and and it's nice it's nice to meet all the aussie girls who are working in paddocks down there as well um so you know all the girls who are working super cup and that kind of thing now finally you brought up a little bit of rallying there before i'm glad you did that i hope you didn't undersell it too much in your uh, in your comment because if i'm right back in 1999 there is a third in class for you in the british round of the world championship I have the trophy right here, sitting, sitting. So cool. By my desk. Tell me what you were driving and tell us a bit more about that. It says third in class, uh, class A5. That's like the tiniest, teeniest little. I was driving a, a Ford car um, with a, a lovely Irish journalist called Morris Hamilton, who who you will know. Yeah, Morris yeah. Was, was my co-driver. You know, that started out to... Tony was big into his rallying. So, um, and I can remember him one day calling me into the office and saying, what are you doing at the weekend? Nothing particularly. Why is it up? Right. You're going to be my co-driver on the Y Dean stages. I need a rally driver. My regular rally driver's pulled out. So it was like, fine, in at the deep end. Absolutely loved it. Um, And then... um, so I'd always, you know, got an ear open and stuff and then suddenly cut forward, you know, when I'm working for TV, suddenly people are more more likely to say, would you like to have a go driving our car? So Ford came along. They had this Ford car championship. They said, did I fancy having a go? So I was like, yeah, I'm 100% up for that. So that's how it started. I absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. And, and worked towards, um, you know, get, building up my skills so that I could... Um, do do Wales Rally GB, which you know, and and rallying to be able to compete on the same stages at the same time as a you know a world class event like that was just incredible. And the step up, you know, I I was used to doing national rallying. Uh, the only time you saw people was when there was, a, you know, if you saw people out on the stage, you thought, oh, I need to be careful here because that's where you were most likely to have an accident. That's why they were standing there. Whereas, you know, when you're doing a world championship event, the streets were lined with people as you're driving from, from stage to stage. And particularly there was one day when the the last couple of stages were, were cancelled for those of us who were running further down the field. So it the, the big cars went on to do them. But that meant that basically we've now cut ahead. So 
my little class, which was one of the very small classes, so we're running at the back of the field. We are now driving on the road just ahead of the main stars of the World Rally. So, as I say, we're driving through streets and you know, or little villages in the middle of nowhere where everybody's come out to watch the, the superstars of rallying come past. And there's myself and Morris waving at them as we go past and beeping the horn. And but yeah, what, <laughs> what an experience! What and what an amazing experience! I just loved it. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I sort of sometimes think now, God, I'd love to do that again. But I, I know I, I, I got to the by the time I was doing Wales Rally GB, I really got my eye in, and certainly on that event, I, I really found out what they meant about being in the zone. You know, Morris and I were absolutely spot on. He was calling two corners ahead. He knew what I wanted, the information I wanted, when I needed it. I was visualizing stuff. It was all those kind of things that you think, wow, this is what this is a, a tiny you know, shining a tiny light into that that world of, of sort of professional driving, mm. being a professional sports person. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, if I tried it again now, I'd be absolute rubbish and 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 I'd kick myself for, for being so slow. But um, yeah, it was a, an amazing opportunity. I absolutely loved it. You can walk it, you can talk it. I knew this podcast was going to be good because our dinners when we're together for the Australian Grand Prix and a few other events we get to do from time to time, <laughs> the conversation is always terrific. Thank you very much for the little insight around attitude and application for media training. I reckon that's a great takeaway, as I said before, for the young racers that are listening to this. Congratulations on everything you've done in your career so far and keep powering, Lou. I look forward to more on-air stuff with you in the years ahead. Thank you so much, Rusty. It's always good to chat to you and I look forward to catching up soon. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series editor and producer is Thomas Dullard. Audio production by Link Kelly. If you've got a guest suggestion, get in touch with me via social media. The Garage, that's where a journey begins with a tank full of passion-fuelled stories. Stories.